morning and a warm welcome to worship in North Middletown Christian Church on this, the third Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord. If you're watching from home, we say hello and welcome. If you're wondering how we are able to continue meeting safely during this, this time of rapid transmission of the Omicron virus, it is because, although you can't see the congregation, we are all masked and distanced from one another. And I assure you that there is plenty of room for you here if you would ever like to join us for worship. Here in Kentucky, we are experiencing frigid temperatures, uh, but we're here in the warmth and safety of the house of the Lord. And it is good to be together. So we invite you, if you feel safe and if you are able to join us, to please do so anytime. You are welcome. We shared our joys as well as our concerns and the announcements uh, for the life of the church before we began our worship service. But if you would like to be added to the prayer list or if you would like to be part of our communications and mailing list, just contact us through our website. There's a, a place where you can contact the office there at northmiddletownchristianchurch.org. And so now we will prepare ourselves to receive worship as Doug Price, our director of music, plays the prelude. And as we light the candles, remembering, uh, reminding us of the presence of Christ, who is with us always. Let us worship.
by your worship, help us live into that new life, refreshed and renewed for your word. Amen. But we are grateful 
that they did not experience severe illness. We pray for others who need healing and comfort of body, mind, and spirit. We pray also for many who mourn, that they shall know your peace. We pray for our government leaders, Joseph, our president, Andy, our governor. We pray for our national, state, and local leaders who represent us in various legislative bodies. We pray for your wisdom to prevail and that they seek justice and peace for the good of all their people. We pray for our church leaders, our general minister and president, Reverend Terry Horde Owens, as she enjoys a much needed and well-deserved sabbatical. We pray for Reverend Dr. Don Gillette, our regional minister, for Dave, Carol, Terry, Barbara in our office, and our new ministers, Tammy and Molly. We ask God that they will continue to lead us as individual churches in the fellowship of covenant that we enjoy with the Christian church in Kentucky. And so God, hear all our prayers, for you know what is on our hearts and minds. You know our prayers even better than we can speak them. And so hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from John 3, chap, uh, chapter 3, 1 through 21. Jesus teaches Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But, I, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then can you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, 
that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God, one and only Son. This is the verdict. Life has come into the world, but man loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, but will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. A word from the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year on July 26, I call my child to give birthday greetings. And I can't help but go through the memories of that day, the day of Chris's birth. And so I call it the exact time. And I say, oh, this was the time that I had been measuring my contractions. And I called the doctor on duty. And he said in his South African accent, oh, make haste. <laughs> and then I talk about how quickly and easily the labor was or how our car's battery died right as we got to the hospital in the drop-off lane. And the security was really mad at us and wanted us to move the car, but we were a little involved. We get this baby out of me. Or sometimes I recollect how it was a full moon that night and we were lucky to get a room at Northside Hospital, Atlanta's baby factory. It was very crowded. And then I gear up to reenact the birth. I start heaving and panting and screaming and pretending like I'm pushing. And Chris is like, the love of God, and usually hangs up on me before I get too far into it. But I think it's very important to go through the facts of what happened just to remind my child of what I went through to bring that little bundle of joy kicking and screaming into the world. Although Chris acts like this is annoying and of no importance whatsoever, I think that many of us desire to know our origin story. Just how in the world did we get here? Did anything significant happen along the way or did anything funny take place? And when I was a teacher, I would sometimes ask my kids about their story of origin. And I asked on, on this questionnaire, this get to know you activity that I did at the beginning of the semester, I asked them, where were you born? And one of the children, I swear I should have kept this, said, behind the Waffle House. <laughs> and I always wondered, was there a hospital behind the Waffle House someplace where they literally just born out there behind the Waffle House? And I always feel so sorry for those poor children that are given those names based on where they were born. You know, if their mother couldn't make it to the hospital or something, and they must always wonder, Mom, why do I have this crazy name? To which you reply, sit down, Paris Pike, and finish your, your broccoli. Quit asking me all these questions. And, you know, I recall that um, Reese's son is named Thatcher. So I surmise that he was probably just born out here someplace on, on Thatcher's Mill, and that commemorates the place of his birth. And sometimes I put these little nuggets into the sermon so that when I ask Reese on Monday about it, I can tell that she didn't listen. <laughs> when I asked my own mother about my birth, she remembered going into labor and she remembered calling the doctor's office and speaking to the nurse who pulled, pulled away from the phone and was telling the doctor that Mrs. Moon thought she was going into labor. 
To which he responded where she could hear it, tell her she's not in labor, it's only gas. <laughs> then my mother shortly gave birth to me and says I've been a pain ever since. <laughs> But she doesn't remember the actual birth because she was given a cocktail of drugs that made her go into twilight sleep. And this made sure that the woman uh, fell asleep, felt no pain, but it especially had a drug in it that created amnesia. So if you did experience anything, you wouldn't remember it. So there was no screaming, no yelling, nothing dramatic. She just went to sleep woke up and they handed her a clean baby. And I know that we have some fans of The Crown out here, because I heard you talking about it before, before church. You recall that when she gave birth to Charles and Anne, she was asleep and handed a baby. But things changed when it was Andrew and Edward. Her Royal Highness didn't look so prim and pretty, did she, after that? She was just like the rest of us, sweating and panting for her life. So not only do I not remember my birth, like everybody else doesn't remember it, but my mother doesn't remember my birth, and I find that very strange. Now, you all know that I'm from the Deep South, and I have been asked over the years, are you born again? And to that question, I usually just responded yes to avoid any further conversation, because I knew that that was a loaded question, I've been raised in church all my life. I've been baptized at a young age, and I was extremely active. I was a third-generation disciple of a man who started the church that I attended, but no one cared about any of that. Nobody cared about my spiritual development or formation. The litmus test to tell if I was in or out of their Christian circle was, are you born again? And I have to admit, growing up and still sometimes to this day, I don't know exactly what that means. I hear scriptures such as what we had today, and I try to understand what Jesus meant when he said it, but I don't always understand what humans are getting at when they ask that question. Usually, they're talking about, did you have this emotional experience, this conversion that led to baptism, if you've been previously unbaptized, and it usually means like having that really dramatic turning point in your life where you turned away from sin. But being born and raised in the church, I felt like I was always cultivated in my faith. So I didn't have that dramatic conversion. And so when people reference being born again, whether they realize it or not, they're probably talking about John 3, verse 3. If you enter the scriptures about being born again on your computer search bar, a whole list will pop up. But I guarantee you the first one will be John 3, 3. I find it odd that people don't really rephrase it as Jesus did. They don't ask, have you been reborn of the water and the spirit? And so I asked us that question today. Have you been born of the water and the spirit? Now that's a different question. Or, have you been born from above, or anew, as it might be translated from the Greek? Have you been born anew? While that still sounds like a somewhat loaded question, I think it comes a little less loaded with expectations of what that might look like. How you are made anew might be different than how I was made anew. And I think that invites us deeper into contemplation to consider what this might actually mean. And I think it's a very thoughtful thing to ponder. And so I wonder, why don't we ever ask people that question? That leads me to talk about one of my favorite Sundays of the year, and that is the baptism of Jesus. The narrative lectionary that we follow does not dedicate a day to this, but it is in John's Gospel. In fact, it's the very next story. You can tell we're probably leading into baptism at this point. And the reason why I like this day in the life of the church is because of how we observed it at one church. And so I borrowed it, and I brought that tradition here to North Middletown when I came. And you might recall that pre-pandemic, 
we brought those uh, pillars up front and we filled these big glass bowls, not only with water, but with isopropyl alcohol. And you were invited to come forward and dip your hands in the water. You might have done a ritual hand washing, or you might have taken the water and have done the sign of the cross on your hands. But as you came forward and you approached and you touched the water, either by myself or the elders, you were asked to remember your baptism. Even though it's not a good idea for us to come forward in that manner right now, can we not still remember our baptism? And you can do that when you come to any form of water. Stephanie Paulsell, in her book, Honoring the Body, shares a story of a young woman, a friend of hers, who is absolutely tormented with terrible acne. As you can understand, being a young person, that can be quite a difficult situation, socially, and for her self-confidence. And she had just tried everything, from over-the-counter remedies to prescription drugs. And of course, part of that regimen was to keep her skin as clean as possible. But with all that she had to do and seeing no results, she began to become very discouraged. And then her father led her to the sink, the basin of water, and told her every time she washed, to make it a sacramental experience and to splash her face once in the name of the Father and the second time in the name of the Son and the third time to be baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I've carried that thought, that story with me. We can do the same thing all the dozens of times a day that we're washing our hands now. Rather than seeing happy birthday, perhaps we can sing the doxology a few times to bring ourselves closer and make that a ritual with the water and we can remember our baptism. Perhaps people might look at you funny if you're in a public restroom, but that's okay too. In these little small acts of baptism, we wash away everything that obscures us from the sacredness that is inherent in our vulnerable bodies. In the bath of baptism, it is our vulnerability itself that is clothed in mercy that can never be removed, says Stephanie Paulson. So I invite you to do that as you wash or as you bathe, to just remember your baptism and how that made you feel so beloved by God. For my friends and also my husband, who was Methodist and baptized as an infant, I question, what is it like to not be able to remember your baptism? To which one of them responded, oh, I remember my baptism every day. And of course, he doesn't remember it because he was an infant. But what he remembers, however, is being raised up in that community that felt it was so important to him as a vulnerable infant to give him that sprinkle of water and to confer the grace of God upon him, to receive the blessings of the church body, to make him one with the body of Christ. And so although he does not remember the baptism, every day they remember it. In this way, I wonder if those baptized as infants might have an advantage over us who are baptized older. For when we remember our baptism, we recall a particular moment in time. And like Nicodemus, we might become distracted by all the physical implications. I can remember the temperature of the water and the minister who was there and the towel that went over my nose, but I don't really remember a whole lot of the spiritual implications. But for these people who are infants, they are trying to piece together over the course of their life, how that sacred act secured for them a place in God's presence that they must live into every day. And so I think being baptized and remembering it is a lot like being birthed. We don't remember our birth, but we know that it happened. And we can make sense of this physical life we live without remembering it. And perhaps, too, we can make sense of our spiritual lives even if we don't remember our baptisms 
or if we remember just the physical and not the spiritual aspects of it. We can take that spiritual reckoning with us life. You know memory plays a crucial role. We gather at the table weekly for a meal of remembrance. Now we were not there at the original Last Supper, of course, so we can't remember what happened, but in our own way, with our reenaction, we are taking part of it as if it is our meal as we gather to commune. And so I ask us, as we gather at the table of the Lord and we recall such things, can we not recall that we need to be reborn or born anew every day? It says that Jesus came into the world so that the world might be saved. And that verb for saved is translated from the Greek word sozo, and we don't quite capture the entirety of what this verb means by saying saved, nor do we capture the sense. It is not past tense as if something that has already completely happened. It is literally translated as may be being saved. This ongoing event this is why we can remember the baptism of Jesus and recall or anticipate our own baptism. And every time we remember his baptism and death, we recall how we participate in it. And that is what makes it salvific. Because we can continually remember and live into it, there is no need to be rebaptized over the course of your life. Of course we will sin. Of course we will need forgiveness. But we are being saved. It's this ongoing transformation that we can understand it better the more deeply we attempt to live into it. And so now, I know you're dying for me to go further into John 3.16, some of the most popular verses of all the Gospels. And so here we are. This entire passage leads up to it. It is not that our baptism saves us in a way that we have spiritual immortality. Our baptism gives us renewed life here on earth. A quality of life that shapes our awareness of the unending presence of the Spirit of God among us always. In this way, Jesus links our earthly birth with our spiritual one, and they are both of the water. But only one of them is from above. I don't have many regrets in life, but one of them is that I did not get a chance to take homiletics from Reverend Dr. John Claypool when he taught at McAfee School of Theology. He became an Episcopal priest after spending most of his career as a good Baptist, and when some of the changes started taking place in the Southern Baptist Convention, he found himself without a spiritual home and then later would find the Episcopal Church or God would lead him to it. But for many years, he was minister at Crescent Hill Baptist in Louisville. And he ended the service for many years with the following benediction. And I share it with you now. Depart now and the fellowship of God the Father. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. By the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. In other words, you are in process, my friend. I grant that you live fully into this process so that your awareness of it increases, so that you might boldly proclaim when others ask you, are you saved? You can say, yes, I may be being saved right now as we are speaking, and I hope that I may be saved rest of my life. Amen. And now we move into an act 
of remembrance. One that we do not recall factually, except that it's, it's presented to us, preserved in the scriptures. But we enter into this story nonetheless, for it is also our story that Jesus, when he gathered with his disciples, he bid them to remember him as simple elements of bread and wine. So that any time we eat together, there he is in our fellowship. And as we remember, we participate in his life, his death, his resurrection, and we boldly proclaim him that we might be being saved by him until we die. Let us prepare to receive Holy Communion.
For I have received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <clears throat> Once again, a warm welcome to worship, and if you're in person here and haven't already done so, please take an opportunity now to fill out your welcome card. Uh, that gives us a record of your attendance, and it also provides us with a wonderful opportunity that leads into the next act of our worship. Some call it offering, but it's really an opportunity to express gratitude. And so write down your thanksgivings on the back of your card and place them in the offering plate as it is passed today so that we might celebrate with one another the amazing and wonderful things that God is still doing in our lives. There are many reasons to give. Perhaps you know of some. We can give out of obligation. We can give out of guilt. I'm going to share a story with you of giving out of annoyance. Every year, a woman who was the neighborhood busybody and gossip would go to, throughout our neighborhood door to door soliciting people's payments for the homeowners association. Now this was a voluntary association, but she still went door to door trying to shame people into giving anyway. And so when she knocked on the door of my household home, my mother welcomed her in, where she proceeded to talk and talk and talk and gossip, gossip, gossip. And my mother slowly, I remember this, got out her checkbook and just started writing the check and handed it to her. When she did, she goes, here, this is for the next five years. <laughs> we don't want to give begrudgingly like that. All of our giving should flow first for gratitude. And so that's what we see in these plates and in the basket today. Signs of our gratitude. And so with generous and joyful hearts, let us give what we are able from the abundance that God has already given us.
prayer for all the blessings we receive. We ask God that you will bless all of these gifts for the ministry of the church. But today, we especially uplift our backpack program for the children and families who will receive these blessings. We pray for all our students throughout Bourbon County, but especially for our neighborhood school, North Middletown Elementary School. We pray all the way from the principal to the teachers, lunchroom staff, janitors, bus drivers, and especially the children of our community. Please magnify these gifts and bless their lives so that they will know your love. Amen. And now you have an invitation to discipleship. Most of you have confessed your faith. You have entered into the baptismal waters. You have pro proclaimed Jesus as Lord. But today, and moving forward, I want you to remember your baptisms. The promises not only you made, but the promises that were made to you. From God's Holy Spirit to the fellowship of the community, that we are one in our baptism. And as you approach the daily water of washing your hands or bathing or even doing the dishes, those can be transformed into holy, sacred moments as you remember how important that was in your life and how that leads you to help reveal the face of Christ to others. Let us sing our hymn of departing.
They'll leave it running for a little bit. Please do that. They love to see your faces and it make them feel a little more a part of, of what we've done here today. You are not required to do so yet, uh, but you're invited and encouraged to do so. And so now receive this blessing. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father, and as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this hour. By the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. Amen and Amen. Did you get your did you wave? Hello, Michelle. 